You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. So welcome to episode 274. And in this episode, I chat with Shai Friedland. Shai is a clinical psychologist in Johannesburg, South Africa, and he specializes in the treatment of OCD. And I got him on to share his OCD story. So he has is affected by OCD, and uh, he's also as part of his journey trained to become a clinical psychologist in South Africa. So I got him on to talk about that too, and what OCD in South Africa is like, and the advocacy, etc. So. Uh, Really nice chat with Shai. I enjoyed this one and hopefully you will too. And thanks as always to NoCD for supporting the show and the work that we do. NoCD are now operating in Australia as well as UK and USA. So good work to NoCD for continuing their expansion and thank you to them for sponsoring the show. And if you want to find out more, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. So thanks as always to you guys for listening to the show. I deeply appreciate it and I hope it helps you in some way. And without further ado, here is Shai. Welcome to the show, Shai. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's good to have you here. And um, as we discussed, you know, it'd be great to hear your OCD story or otherwise. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think, you know, just, just to talk about my OCD journey and my OCD story, where to really start is, is quite is quite difficult, but I'll start mm. maybe from the beginning. I think, you know, when I was younger, I, I, I wouldn't say I had OCD, but almost when I did when I did develop OCD and I got diagnosed with OCD and I looked back, there were definitely certain things when I was younger. It was more, it came out more sort of as superstitious things. I think mm. I played a lot of sports. Um, I watched a lot of sports. And often, you know, I would uh, I'd do a lot of swimming and I would have a favorite lane or I'd have a favorite swimming costume. And it wasn't just sort of superstition. It was almost that I, I almost had this belief that if I wore that costume, I would win the race. Hmm. And, and those little things, I had, I'd have rituals that I'd have to do before I swam or before I, I don't know, I used to go play cricket and before I used to go into bat, I'd have all these rituals. But the rituals weren't to make me focus. They were almost to, to get rid of anxiety before. Hmm. So that that seemed to be around for a for a very long time, but then you know almost when I was about sixteen or seventeen years old, um, I think almost like a rush, a lot of these these OCD symptoms came about, and that's when things really start to get quite difficult for myself. Um, when I was sixteen, six or seventeen, I don't really know to this day really what the trigger was. Um, I, I'm not sure there there was, I thought maybe, you know, it could have been my grandfather passing away and, and that was quite a big thing for me and was the first person I'd lost in my life and maybe that was a trigger. But but looking back, I actually felt the OCD maybe even started even before that. So I'm not really sure, but they just sort of came, they came out of the blue. And I think what happened was is that it started off initially as as contamination OCD. So what would happen is that I, w- I was worried about getting dirty germs. There was no real thought behind it almost. It was just that germs were bad or, or dirt was bad. So I would start to wash my hands and uh, I'd wash my hands. At times that started to get a bit worse and I would I would shower sort of continuously. Um, I, I would shower morning, then I'd start shower morning and night in morning, afternoon, and night. And in this time, I was, I was washing my hands. And then almost what happened was is that even though my symptoms came on in a rush, they started to snowball and, and, and they started to get worse and worse and sort of go go from, from bad to, to mm. much worse, to be honest with you. And um, what happened from there is that then I started to get thoughts around that I'm going to contract HIV and AIDS. Mm. Um, and that also, you know, anything that I would touch, if, for example, it had rust on it or if it just had a little sort of bump or uh, I scratched myself, it immediately my thoughts would go to I have HIV and I'd have to 
sort of in my head, I knew, knew it was illogical, but I must wash my hands or I must shower mm. to get rid of it, right? So I had these thoughts that, that, that about the HIV, and then I would start to almost avoid touching anything, both because of germs, but also because, well, what if it had a rough surface and that I may contract it, right? Um, and, and the washing seemed to get a lot, a lot worse. And then I started to almost, it, it, it led into me not wanting to touch other people mm. for fear of other people having germs, for fear of other people, you know, potentially being sick with some type of disease, not only HIV, something else. And as, and as illogical and as irrational as that was, I think my thoughts went to, you know, well, if I do touch them, can it, can it maybe transfer to me? Um, I know it can't, but what if, you know, there's a 0.001% chance of this, you know, so I would, I almost avoided people. And in particular, I avoided standing in front of someone and talking to them in case like sort of some spit would come over from their mouth into my eyes or my mouth. And so I really stopped, I really started avoiding people and and that started to get a bit worse. I, I would also, if I had to touch somebody, I'd quickly run and go wash my hands. But, but, you know, as you can imagine, gatherings, uh, going to the mall, uh, sports, everything became very, very difficult because these are very difficult places not to get into in contact with people. Yeah. And, and then it sort of spiraled into if somebody touched something, right, uh, like let's say at the shop, somebody touched a pair of uh, a clothing item, then there was almost a secondary touch. So if I touched the item after they had touched it, I was also again contaminated. Again, with germs, with dirt, again, potential diseases, uh, HIV. So, so it started well, and I had to then wash my hands, even if I touched something that somebody else had potentially touched. And that started to, to get really bad. And I was, I was struggling with that significantly. It was taking up a lot of time in my day. But then almost after that, that, that continued. But what I started to develop was almost mental contamination. And it started with, um, you know, if I had a thought about somebody or some place that some person that I thought was, a, in my mind, a bad person, done something wrong, or a place that I had been to where something bad had happened or, you know, I'd got bad news or I'd felt bad or I'd been anxious. And every time that I thought, I thought that, I, I would think that I'm now contaminating the area that I'm in or the people that I'm around. So again, as soon as I had the thought, I'd either try and avoid thinking about it or again, I'd go and wash my hands, knowing that it's illogical that if I wash my hands, how can I get rid of a thought or contaminate myself from some type of thought? But I just almost was compelled to do this. And as I wash my hands, I would obviously in the moment feel a lot better. Um, but again, this started to spiral as well. and then with the mental contamination is that I started to have these mental thoughts that, that something bad would happen to me or something bad would happen to the people that I loved. So, and it really could have been, could have been anything, right? So I, I thought that, well, if I, if I did something and while I was doing that thing and, and really it started to spiral into everything, you know, um, if I did this thing and I had a bad thought, then either I would have to redo that thing and have a and have a, a, a positive thought or sometimes not even a positive thought, what I used to call neutral thoughts, um, just a thought that is almost almost nothing. And uh, that was really anything, getting out of bed, uh, getting in and out of the shower, writing in, sc in, in school at the time and then university and afterwards, as soon as I wrote something and I had a bad thought, I had to cross that out. Um, even sometimes if I had to, you know, I had to, I was praying and, and, and I said, said a prayer and I had a bad thought, I had to redo, redo it. And I started to redo things over and over and over again. And in that process, it's uh, the best way I can describe this is almost that uh, boundaries became an issue. I, I use the word boundaries, but like things like, you know, getting in and out of bed. Um, that was like a boundary for me. Getting in and out of the shower was a boundary. A boundary was going with into a room or leaving a room or going into the house or leaving the house or getting into my car or leaving my car. It was almost as if the start and finish of something were very important. So getting out of bed represented the start of the day. 
uh, getting out of the shower represented the start of being clean. Um, getting into the shower was the finish, finishing of being clean or getting into bed was the finish of, of the day. And these things I got as barriers and they became very, very sort of significant to me is that if I had a bad thought over that boundary, then I had to redo that boundary. So, I mean, <laughs> there were times I was getting in and out of bed or going in and out of a door or getting out of the shower multiple, multiple, multiple times. It was almost like I was just redoing it and redoing it and redoing it. And then also with washing of my hands, you know, if I washed my hands and had a bad thought that something bad would happen, well, then what sort of happened from there was that I'd have to rewash my hands. And, uh, you know, I had, I had a certain way I had to do it. I had a certain way that uh, I had to wash my hands. So as soon as I had a bad thought, I'd have to start the process again. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, as I suppose a lot of people who have contamination OCD might know, it's, you know, sometimes washing hands is not just washing hands. It's a whole ritual that can take, yeah. it can take, five, 10, 30 minutes, an hour of time just to wash your hands. So to restart that and try and not have a negative thought in that time is really difficult. And it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's impossible, you know what I mean? At times it's, so, so I was, I was doing it over and over and over again. And again, even just getting out of bed, trying to have a neutral thought. And then, you know, you'd cross the boundary and then you'd have a bad thought afterwards. And then it's doubt. It's well, wait a second. Did it, was I through the door? Was I not through the door? Um, should I do it again? Oh, let me just do it again, just to be mm. safe. And, and, and yeah, you know, it just it was just became so time consuming after a while that I was I was I was non functional. You know, what happened then was it spiraled even further, in that certain numbers had had value to me. What I mean by that is that if, for example, um, somebody that I care about is born on the tenth of a month or the, the 15th of a month, you know, or the 11th of a month or something like that. Uh, if I did something, um, I, I would never wash my hands, for example, 10 times because I was worried that if I stopped in the 10 times and I had a bad thought, the doubt would creep up again and go, well, yeah, that bad thought means that that bad thing is going to happen to that person that I care about because their birthday is on the 10th. As illogical and as, <laughs> as irrational as that almost sounds, to me today, in that moment, that was just the thoughts, you know. The yeah. and in the moment, I would think almost at times it's illogical, but I just couldn't stop myself at that moment, right? I just thought I couldn't. Uh, the, the anxiety that I got was just really extreme, and um, oftentimes it was almost just, yeah, well, what if? And you know what? If anything does happen, I can't live with a doubt. It would be my responsibility. Um, so. That started to spiral as well. And, and then I would try and get out of bed. And, you know, you get out of bed on the 10th time and you finally have a, have a good thought. But, oh, wait, it's, it's the 10th time and that's somebody's birthday. And I can't do it on the 10th. So I'd get back in bed and try and do it again on the, on the 11th. And each number became, had some significance to it. I used to have maybe in, in, in North 2, let's say 50, I maybe had three or four numbers that were neutral that I could try and get out of bed on and, and the pressure to try and have a good thought on those numbers. Obviously, as we know with OCD, now you don't want to have the thought on that number, and that's obviously when that, that negative thought is, is yeah. going to come. So, so yeah, it, it really sort of it got me quite, it got me quite stuck. A along with that, what then developed was a lot of checking as well. I kept on checking mm. everything. I, I would check that doors were closed. I would check that the windows were closed. I would check that my car was locked. I would check sort of all the doors in the car, I'd check the alarm. I'd go back, I'd check multiple times. And again, the same sort of idea around numbers came in. So I couldn't check it a certain amount of times. I could then check it on a neutral number, but I couldn't have a negative thought. Um, you know, <laughs> Stuart, it got to such a point, got to, I was checking so much that I actually I broke a door handle at home and I broke a door handle on my car. I, I was checking for such amount of time, you know. And and I think when I broke the car door, it almost sort of was like a, a big realization for me that, whoa, something is is, you know, what's going on here? And my hands, my hands became sort of red and cracked from the amount of times I was I was I was washing them. I was not functional. I mean, I was at university at this stage now and I was I stopped going to university. I wasn't going. 
I, I would shower for, oh, I mean, there were there were days I could shower for three, four hours on an end because, you know, I wasn't clean or I would get out the shower and then have to get back in and because I had a bad thought and get out and then and and then because I had a bad thought I'd had to restart the shower because of you know it's uh, I'm contaminated now I had a bad thought I need to restart and restart the day with being clean so really almost in a way I, I would say I, I was stuck I got completely stuck at times and doing certain things and you know the mundane things that I think everyone takes for granted is brushing your teeth and just doing hygiene and showering and getting out of bed and getting into bed. They became, they became toils for me. They became absolute sort of, they became absolutely draining. I mean, just switching a light on and off became this, this big thing in my mind, this, this idea that, wow, you know, I, 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 I don't know how I'm going to get through it. it. It's almost Mount Everest in front of me. Um, and I really, really, really struggled to to do these things. I, I had to do all of them because, again, it's like not stuff I could avoid. And obviously, at that point in time, you want to avoid things, knowing now, obviously, that that avoiding is is not good either for OCD. But even these things, I, I couldn't avoid them. They were you can't avoid hygiene. You can't avoid getting in and out of bed. You can't avoid putting on and off lights in a way. They just day to day activities, um, and yeah, it, it really, really started to to spiral. And the other thing that, that happened was then I, I had this idea of this sort of this idea of perfectionism. That things and imperfectionism more in a way of things being complete. So, you know, if I was reading a book or if I was I was um, doing something, I would have to read the chapter complete. If that took me six hours and I started reading at 11 at night. If I'm going to finish at five in the morning, I'm going to finish at five in the morning just to complete that chapter. Um, and again, in that chapter, I'm rereading words because of bad thoughts and whatever the, whatever I'm sort of thinking so I can have a good thought or a neutral thought. But as I'm getting to the end of, uh, of that chapter, I have to finish it. Um, the same thing with, uh, you know, if I had to write something, if I had to do homework for university or something like that, I'd have to make sure that I absolutely completed in the in, in one sitting because then it wasn't complete. Uh, and everything, all these type of things, you know, uh, if I was doing a prayer, I had to finish a prayer and complete that. If I, if I was, um, I don't know, I was cleaning my car, I had to make sure that I cleaned it absolutely everywhere and I was perfect and I didn't miss a spot, so it was absolutely completely, perfectly finished. And and that also then was added on top of this. And, yeah, as I say, you know, I was completely, completely not functional. Uh, uh, I wasn't going out. I, I, I'd stopped my university. And, yeah, I think this, this continued for, oof, I was about 16, 17 when it started. I would say it continued until I was about, you know, 21, 22, 23, somewhere around there, uh, I was trying to deal with it. I kept on, I kept on thinking to myself, you know, um, you know, I'm a freak. There, there, there's something completely wrong with me. No one else thinks like this. I used to have this idea that it'll, it'll get right, it'll come right, and then also to the idea of sort of telling somebody this was going through your head became a massive, massive thing. Uh, who, who can I tell? Who's gonna believe me? Who's gonna who's gonna you know, I'll tell somebody they're gonna maybe lock me up and think I'm you know mm. there's nothing that I can do and and again there was you know sort of a very sort of there was a big lack of awareness uh, around it in that in those days. Uh, I mean we're talking about a good sort of fifteen to eighteen years ago now almost even more you know and I, I didn't know what was happening with me. I didn't have an idea what was happening kept on thinking it'll it'll go away or I'll deal with it on my own. But yeah, eventually it 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 spiraled to such a point that uh, you know I, I had to. I, I, I eventually spoke to I eventually spoke to my parents about it and said, you know, um, something's going on here. I don't know what it is. And I for some reason I don't know how what I've never really read about it i've never really heard about it but i said to my, my parents you know i think i've got something called ocd um 
just also in the midst of all of this, when I was younger, I also used to have these sort of comorbid tics. I used to blink a bit and 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 and, and, and do stuff with my eyebrows. I used to have these facial sort of tics that sort of came and went. They they waxed and they waned, um, and and those sort of sets went away, but the other stuff stayed. And I and I and I said to my folks, I think this is this must be OCD, but I'm not sure. Luckily, luckily, um, you know, they 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 said to me, no, they were understanding. They heard what I was saying, and and they found me somebody to go to go and see. You know, I uh, I went to a psychologist here in in South Africa. That's that's where I, I live, and the psychologist saw me and and he diagnosed me with OCD, but he said he didn't deal with OCD. So eventually, what he did was he he directed me and he said to me, look, I think two things. One, you need to go and see a, a psychiatrist and he recommended someone. And then he said, you need to go and see this person who, who, who deals very specifically has a special interest in OCD. Um, and anyways, what happened then was, is that I, yeah, I went off and I was desperate. I must say I was extremely desperate. I was, I wanted to get a started straight away. And luckily, luckily I got in, pretty easily and pretty pretty quickly at that stage and I first went to the psych- the psychiatrist um, and the psychiatrist saw me also diagnosed me with with OCD and put me onto an SSRI I think I went on to Cipramil initially and the medication really started to to help me quite a bit it took a bit of time obviously to get into the my system but once it did it really started to help and then uh, you know, I went to the psychiatrist, and then she said to me, "You know, you know, Sha, I'm, uh, I'm actually part of a, a drug trial for Ciprolex, and um, what we can do, if you would like, maybe we put you on the trial and see and see what happens. Obviously, you'll get the medication for free, and you know, let's it's it's a good way to see uh, to give back and, and to see if the medication will work. And at that point in time, I just I agreed. I said, no, that's not a problem." And I went on to this trial, and <laughs> suddenly my, my symptoms started to get worse um, again. And, and we didn't know, I don't know what was happening. Eventually, after like a few weeks or a few months on this trial, uh, she, she said, no, no, something's going on. And we had a look, and I was given the, <laughs> I was given the, the, the sugar pill. The placebo, yeah. The placebo, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so eventually they, they stopped that, took that off, and, and I got then given the Ciprolex, the actual tablet. And again, my symptoms started to improve. But uh, then really sort of what, what really helped me, and, and, and I truly believe sort of changed my life in many ways, which I can speak about going forward as well. What really changed my life was that I went to the psychologist who had a special interest in OCD. And uh, he did CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and in particular, it was EOP, exposure and response prevention. Hmm. And uh, sure, he, you know, he started with me, and then we sat down, and I, I honestly thought, you know, how am I ever going to deal with this? What am I going to do? This, this, the, the, these symptoms in front of me seemed like Mount Everest. It seemed like I don't know how I'm ever going to get through these symptoms, but you know. Interestingly enough, we uh, we did. You know, I met him and, and, and he spoke to me and he said to me, "You know, Sha, it is it's OCD, as as everybody else had said to me. But let's let's see what we can do. Let's see how we can get through this." And he explained the whole concept. He explained the concept of exposures to me. He explained the concept of of the desensitization of it going up and coming down. And just knowing that, also, you know, he said that he gave me examples of other people who have who have. OCD and, and and who he's seen, just knowing that already gave me a sense of okay, well, I'm not a freak. Mm. <laughs> I'm not uh, different to other people. There are a lot of people who do who do have this, and he's dealt with a lot of people who have this, and he's really sort of you know he's he's got some results with it. And it really sort of uh, it started to help build my confidence a bit, and then we started to do some work. We uh, he obviously made me build an exposure hierarchy, and then put down all the different um, obsessional thoughts that I was that I was having, all the all the compulsions that I was that I was doing along with the thoughts. And yeah, almost I built this this list. 
And again, you know, I use the metaphor, it looked like Mount Everest in front of me. Mm. But what was very interesting is, you know, we started, uh, I remember him saying to me, we're not going to start at the highest. We're not going to start right down at the lowest. We're going to start somewhere. I think we did a scale of 0 to 10, if I, if I remember correctly. And 10 being the worst, zero being absolutely no anxiety. And he said, let's, let's see, maybe we can start around a four or a five, something that's challenging, but uh, also something that's, that's not going to you know, be too difficult right now and something that will push you. And we started at that, at that level and we did a few exposures. They were extremely difficult. I remember initially also in his room when we did them, they were, they were difficult, but I was able to do them. And the first week or two, I would go home and almost, and it was so difficult. I went back to him saying, you know, it's so easy in your room, but I, when I get home, it becomes significantly more difficult again. And, you know, I don't know what that is. And he just reassured me saying, you know, it's okay. It takes a bit of time. Mm -hmm. And eventually when I was able to do it on my own and start to do these exposures on my own, um, he, you know, we started at a level, as I said, about four or five out of 10. And as I did it, all of a sudden, this big Mount Everest of all these exposures actually just, it almost just came crashing down. I don't even think I needed to do the exposures of the higher ones. It was, it was quite interesting. I just, I started it below and all of a sudden, it's almost as if we took the legs out from underneath the OCD and it crashed. Mm. And I would say, you know, I had probably had between, it's, it's hard to remember now, but between six and eight or eight and 10 sessions, I think, of, of ERP. And all of a sudden, this, the OCD just got significantly better. My functioning got better. I went back to university. I was able to study. Um, from there, uh, I stayed on the medication, I think, for about, whew, um, I think I stayed on the medication for about four years. So so uh, I was on the medication at least for a good maybe two or three years after therapy. And then I started actually weaning off the medication. I went to the psychiatrist. We decided, you know, I, I felt like I had a good skill set. I felt like from the ERP, I knew, you know, how to deal with it and slowly, slowly came off. And Stuart, luckily, since then, you know, the, the, I've been able to deal with it. Luckily, the symptoms haven't, haven't come back. And when I do get certain symptoms, you know, I, I'm able to, to put the exposure and, and in, in place myself. And it really sort of, as, as my therapist at that stage explained to me, you know, initially when you do it, it's this massive spike in anxiety. You've got to sit it out, let it come down. But now when I do it, you know, it spikes, but not nearly as, as high and it comes down. And they have been very, very infrequently, luckily. And I'm, I say I haven't been on the meds. I haven't really looked back. And, yeah, it's, 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 it really did, as I say, changed my life and in, in many ways. It made me better. But then it also, it, it gave me a, a career path, you know, uh, and some way that I can actually, you know, to make a living and, and saying that I'm passionate about and that I'm interested in. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and going into the detail. Um, and yeah, so you, you start, my next question is obviously like, you know, what got you into doing therapy and specifically for ACD and I guess you kind of answered that but I don't know if there's anything more detail you wanted to give around that yeah I think you know it definitely definitely suffering from OCD was the reason that I wanted to become a therapist my journey still my journey wasn't easy though I think when I got better I went into into psychology and I did like psychology and what's called communications here in South Africa, which is a, an advertising and marketing. It's sort of, it's not really advertising and marketing, but it can lead in that path. And after, after doing my undergraduate, I was meant to go into an honors degree, which, which you do over here. And, uh, you know, I, I was, I wanted to do the psychology, but I almost, you must, I almost talked myself out of it. You know, they, uh, you know, it's very difficult to get in. I kept on saying, um, hmm. you, uh, you, you need you need luck to get in. They only take ten to twelve or eight to twelve people in each university, and then you're not going to get into a try. And, and I almost talked myself out of it. And what I did was I actually then went to the years honors in in brand leadership, which is marketing and that at another university. And from there I did that degree, and then I went 
I went overseas to the UK for a year mm. and I went to go work in the UK. And, and, and strangely enough, I, I landed a, a job doing sort of internal marketing and PR, but at a hospital. And um, what was interesting in that year is that I really, the marketing, the internal PR wasn't for me, but my favorite part of the day was walking around the hospital. It was, you know, being around, around other people, um, helping out around the hospital. And I knew that they had this passion of wanting to help people and, 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 and me wanting to do psychology is what I needed to do. I, I, was, I would be unhappy if I didn't really, really go and do this. I, I decided to come home. I came home after about a year and I, I came back and then I, I did my honours and, and luckily got in and luckily got into to my master's. And yeah, from there, uh, I've been lucky enough to, to get into, into therapy and build a practice where I, I, deal, I, I work from a CBT perspective mainly. I do a lot of ERP and, and, and ACT. And uh, I, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I've been blessed here that, that the practice has grown. And I, and I see a significant amount of people with OCD because, you know, and, and that's, my, that's my passion. That's my area of, of, of special interest. And yeah, it's a, I'm, I'm very, very happy that I have taken this path and that I've, that I've, that I've gone in this way, you know, and um, the idea also is to, to try and impart as much knowledge and, and try and help people in the best way I can and guide them in the best way I can, particularly in, in OCD, whether that's in, in, in children, adolescents or, or adults. And um yeah, and then on top of that, obviously building a practice, you I do a lot of other anxiety work as well, particular anxiety, depression, and that. But my, I would say my main focus is OCD and the OCD, OCD related disorders, the the umbrella of OCD um, disorders. Yeah, no, thank you for that, and um, I'm glad England played some part in your journey. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, England. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it was a small part, but um, so yeah, no, thank you for that. That's, yeah, I'm always fascinated by how people get into therapy and specifically OCD. So you know, I'm I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to South Africa. Um, for a start, I've never been there, uh, and so when I say ignorant, I mean ignorant in the sense of like psychology in South Africa and specifically OCD. So. Uh, what is the awareness like in South Africa for OCD? Yeah. Well, first of all, Stuart, you must come and visit. Yeah, I want to. We've got family <laughs> there. So. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so, look, I think in South Africa, the the awareness of OCD is definitely, definitely growing. I, I do believe that we are a bit further behind than the rest of, than the, rest of the world. And, and what happens in this country is... Uh, I think that we do need a lot more awareness around around OCD, a lot more um, sort of advocacy around OCD, but also a lot more therapists who deal who deal with OCD. I think in certain areas, in the big sort of cities, we have a lot of people that well, not a lot. We have we have people that are that will deal with with OCD in in, mm-hmm. in particular. But then there are a lot of areas in South Africa where there's just no one that is dealing with with OCD specifically. I'm saying, mm-hmm. and we're getting you know I get a lot of calls from different areas where um, you know I can't find anybody. I don't know who deals with this. I want somebody who deals with OCD specifically, and and we really need to 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 grow it. I, I think a, a lot of people in this country also don't sort of understand what OCD is still. Um, we have a lot of sort of misconceptions. Um, as I say, you know, support groups even for for OCD. There's 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 not much, if if any, to be honest with you, which we're trying to to build up, um, and just some advocacy work that it's that it's okay to have it, that it's okay to 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 say that you have OCD. Um, I read a stat somewhere saying that. Another name for OCD is called the secretive disorder because, on average, yeah. it takes people eight or nine years to get help. You know, yeah. um, and 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 you know, that's that's if you if if we know about OCD as well in this in this country, people don't know about it. So a lot of people are are going without any help and, and aren't getting any any type of help. 
and, and that's something that I'm that I'm really passionate about. I want to try and also spread the word, but you know how to go about that is 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 not easy. Um, mm. However, however, you know it's, it's, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, so so uh, I think in a way we in South Africa we we're also building and we're getting there, but we need to get more people who are involved in, in CBT and ERP and in particular for, for OCD, um, for both, for, for children, adolescents and, and adults. But I think we are, we, we, we lag a little bit behind the rest, the rest of the world. And then we have people here who are doing, doing research on OCD, but I think we do need significantly more research. You know, there's a, we're a different culture to the rest of the world. We have different cultures within South Africa mm. and we need to also do our own, some of our own research here and, and, and get more understanding, which I think also needs to be pushed and, 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 and promoted, um, yeah. And, and oftentimes I'm doing OCD, I'm doing therapy with it, but I'm using stats from America, from the UK, from Australia, you know what I mean, to describe these, mm. the, the idea about sort of you know, whatever it is, prevalence, whatever the case may be, when, you know, I, I feel that we need to actually get get more, more research, be more aware of it in this, in this country, yeah. Yeah, really good point. Because yeah, because also themes are going to change by countries, um, mm. and and there was a study done on that. I don't know if South Africa was in it, but yeah, yeah. just it, that you know, if if contamination is a big one in South Africa, then you need to know that so then you can create awareness around it. You know, if harm's a big one, then you can tailor it to that. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ex- exactly. Yeah. So. Um, what what's the stigma like level of like sort of not just OCD but just like mental health generally in South Africa? Is it socially acceptable to be sort of mentally unwell or having troubles yeah. or? Yeah. So look, there, there, there definitely is still a stigma around around mental health uh, within South Africa. However, however, we we are making progress. It's definitely getting getting a lot better. I think a lot mm-hmm. more people are seeking out help. A lot more people are, um, are, 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 are are coming forward and saying that they they're struggling with with their mental health. Um, I know, uh, you know, in the last few years there have also been a lot of um, uh, reported suicides and, and that have gone a bit sort of they've gone public and that and I think that's also made people aware that there's there's difficulties. I mean, even you know, and I'm not saying this is a this is a reason for for breaking the stigma. But mm. even now during lockdown, you know, people being locked down and being being in their homes, and that has, has also created another sort of awareness around sort of mental health. And people, you mm. know, a lot of people are struggling with with mental health with whatever whatever the symptoms they may have. Um, so so we are building. I think we've got a lot of good sort of advocacy advocacy groups, um, people that are trying to get the word out. Um, I am part of a, a large group called SADAG, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. Um, they do a lot of sort of work. They've got a, they a helpline. People can call in if they need any help. They've got a suicide hotline. They've got a lot of different lines that people can call in if they are struggling. They've got referral base around the country. They go out and they give talks, giving talks to schools. But but having said that, you know, I, I think we, we still need significant more, significantly more. I think there are a lot of people out there who still have – a lot of stigma around mental health who won't come forward and and, and, and get and get help. Um, and we, you know, we 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 need to build, we need to build that 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 that, that this idea that you know mental health is, is something that we need to talk about, yeah. something that we need to discuss with 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 our loved ones, with the people around us, have somebody to talk to, get help if you need to need to get help. I mean, you know, even myself, I, I feel like I'm sort of therapeutically minded, but even for me when I was younger, it took me from the age of 16 to the age of 23 to get help, you know, mm-hmm. um, just to talk about it and speak about it. And that was, yes, that was a different time. But, you know, I think for us, yeah, we need to start to to really talk and have conversations about it, which we are. But I think we need to have more 
more of those conversations. So it's a complicated way of answering your questions, Stuart, I understand. But I think we we are definitely getting there, but we need we need a lot more. Yeah, no, thank you for answering it. And I, to be honest, I don't think any country is there yet. I think everyone yeah. has work, even in the UK, we have a lot of work to do, if I'm honest. Um, mm. And and yeah, an OCD, the misconception, I, I'm guessing it's the same for you guys as we would experience in the UK or maybe Canada or America or Australia, where it's seen as overly neat and tidy. And that's kind of the stereotypical view. Is that the case in South Africa as well? Yeah, yeah, I think... I think this idea, you know, people saying sort of very blasely, like I'm OCD. You know, yeah. if I if I have th- if I have my I don't know my my, my cupboard color coordinated with my clothes, or um, I'm just neat and tidy, or mm. you know, but 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 I think obviously, you know, that term, those the terms get thrown around here a lot, a lot, and I think you know where the difference though is is that. A lot of these people can throw that ter- those terms around, but it doesn't impair their functioning. Yeah, uh, you know, and I think it's uh, once you've had OCD and once you've experienced it, or I guess once you work with it as well, you really start to understand how how difficult it is and and how how um, you know it's it's in a way how <laughs> you know just throwing that term around is uh, it's that's not OCD and, and it happens a lot yeah. It happens a lot in, in South Africa, like like as I say, as you say, probably around the world. You know, is, it, is anywhere mm. around the world. Um, and I think that's another thing is to is is to also be able to speak about OCD as as say as a, as a disorder, as as causing dysfunction. Um, a, a lot of times, it's, once it's thrown around, it's almost if I'm neat and tidy, it's a very a very good thing. You know, it's a, it's yeah. good to be to be to be neat and tidy when when you have ocd symptoms i think you realize it's ocd is not you would nobody would say this is a good thing for me now you know i'm i'm saying that i'm i feel almost in a way blessed that i went through it because as i say it's given me a direction it's given me a career it's mm-hmm. given me a path and it's a nice way for me to look at it for me to see it as something that's that's given me something in my life instead of taking things away um but i mean these ocd symptoms can be really severe and yeah happens a lot yeah yeah no thank you for sharing um part of me that the the thought that came to my mind then was i wonder what it's like in say china where obviously they don't speak english they speak mandarin obviously in south africa you speak afrikaans but from what i gather it's a very english-speaking country as well in parts um and i believe this misconception came through the media so i imagine people in china or at least historically were not consuming western media um Mm -hmm. so i wonder if they have similar misconceptions you know i would predict maybe not but yeah that's my own curiosity you know you know in in, in south africa we actually have 11 official languages oh wow okay english is only one of them you know what i mean that i said i I was ignorant so (laughs) (laughs) yeah you know english is english is 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 one of the predominant languages yes Mm. but it's also skewed from my side because I guess in private practice and because I speak English, you know, I see a lot of people who are English. And yes, the media, we have different media outlets and they do things in, in different languages. However, a lot of it is in English. So yes, yeah. uh, that is thrown around. But there, uh, we have multiple, multiple cultures within mm. South Africa and, and the people who speak different types of, of, of languages and it's it's also very interesting, and, and then again, research. You know, research into the different cultures, and 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 if if there is OCD in the different cultures, and how it presents in in different cultures is such a it's fascinating. You know, and yeah. language, how that would be spoken about in 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 a different culture, and and then as you rightly said, you know, themes. Like, could there be different themes within different cultures that we would need to tackle, mm-hmm. and. But then again, you know, in South Africa, we have such a vast, there's such a vast socioeconomic difference that a lot of people in South Africa, unfortunately, don't have access to mental health um, resources. Yeah. We have hospitals, we have clinics and, and, and that type of thing. But, you know, a lot of people are struggling to get this, this access. So if there's a way that we also can, again, uh, talk about it and 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 build awareness around it. Build awareness around it in in, in multiple different cultures. You know, um, 
in whatever culture that may be, that will also benefit benefit people. And then from there, needing to try and find a way with with minimal resources, to be honest with you, mm. find a way of being able to then give that 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 help to people who who, who can't afford it, people who can't get to help. You know, living out in a in a very rural area, mm. being able to even just get access to help. Um, to getting somewhere is, is difficult and then you think well maybe you could do an online session but even then access to 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 internet and wi-fi yeah. is a is an issue and you know so there's there's a lot of barriers unfortunately but i think initially starting with you know just what is ocd and, and how it comes about and yeah. who to speak to and who and, and you know just getting to a, a gp initially and talking about it so it's something that you don't have to necessarily just you know, live within silence, um, hmm. talk to people. And then maybe giving people a platform that, you know, they can get some type of help as in I can, I can, if I can get some internet access or get brochures and that to try and find out yeah. what it is and, and maybe also some, what I, what I can do, you know, it is, you, you can't, you can't replace therapy, but giving people just some maybe psychoeducation on it. And then, yeah. and then, and, and yeah, ideas what maintains around, OCD so. and, how to break yeah. the cycle and yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just some, uh, some things like that, just to make people aware and, and, and also, you know, give, give them and their families. You know, a lot of people, their families are in distress and don't know what to do and mm. give them some type of help with us also how to help a, a loved one. Yeah. Really good points. Um, yeah. Exciting times ahead, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lots to do, yeah. but all good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so slight change of direction. So um, yeah. just any advice you have for living with uncertainty? So, uh, you know, I, I think for, for me, for me, everything, everything's uncertain, right? I think we never know what the next minute, the next mm day the next week's going to be so just to that, that, that living with uncertainty is vitally vitally important and as 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 anybody who has ocd would know is that i think one of the big things we're trying to do is trying to get rid of uncertainty trying to to avoid uh, uncertainty um, and trying to be certain about things i think a lot of one of the, the catchphrases of ocd is what if you know what if this happens well yes that's that's uncertainty and I think the idea then is that, you know, we can never control, never control the future. You can't control what, what's, what's going to happen. You can, you can always put things in place at times. You can, you can try and, you know, uh, do things that, that, that will reduce that, 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 that risk. But I think initially, I think the idea is, that to, is to be okay with doubt. To be okay that things will be uns- there will be uncertainty, and uncertainty may cause significant anxiety. Right, that, that may cause anxiety, but that that anxiety it, it can't necessarily, in a way, harm you. It's just to allow, it's allow yourself to sit with that anxiety, to be with that anxiety. Almost in a way, I talk about it to myself as just make friends with the anxiety. You know, it's like a, it's like a. <laughs> uh, uh, a friend that you don't want to come over or whatever, but they're coming over, you know, instead of fighting them and telling them to go home, let them come in. It almost, mm. it almost will, uh, you, you'll stop noticing that they're there and, and just to uh, you know, sit with that anxiety and then be, and sit with the uncertainty uh, around it. And, and I think that would be my, my, my big advice is just to sit with it, let it be, and to be okay that things are uncertain. And also to know, you know, when we suffer from OCD, you you worried about uncertainty, worried about doubt. To also know that everybody has it. Everybody has has uncertainty. Everybody has doubt. Everyone's living with that day to day. But to allow that just to be. Hmm. Yeah, I like it. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, has your view of OCD treatment changed over the last three years in any way? And if so, how? Yeah, look, I, I think um, initially for me, I started off and I've done a lot of sort of ERP, exposure and response prevention with with uh, with OCD. 
But I think in the last little while, what has changed is I'm doing a lot more sort of acts, acceptance and commitment therapy as well. Mm-hmm. That's sort of come into my practice quite quite a lot, I must say. And and that's uh, that's also helped a lot of people, I feel, uh, here try, get, get help and and and. and and a lot of people that uh, that I've that I've dealt with, almost you know, being person centered and understanding maybe you know ERP or, or ACT. But I would say that's probably been the biggest thing for me over the last few years is that this introduction of ACT into my into my therapy, and and that sort of changed a little bit of the therapy. But integrating the both of them has been important as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I think a lot of people have taken to ACT and merging it with ERP and. Um, yeah okay so uh words of hope for anyone listening be they in south africa or anywhere else in the world um yeah yeah i think just words of hope is that um you know again you don't have to live with ocd in in silence we can do something about it Uh, i think uh listening to all your other your other podcasts you but also you know just maybe hearing, hopefully hearing a story, maybe a story like mine or another story, that there is hope, mm-hmm. that you can get it under control, that you can do something about about OCD, that you don't have to live in, in silence about it, that you don't have to live in constant fear about it. And and that, you know, as, as, as strange and as weird as OCD can be, it can present in so many different forms that, you know, it doesn't matter what form it is, doesn't matter how strange it is, that if you talk about it, if you just say something like like myself, you know, I just had to speak to somebody and I was able to get get that help. They pointed me in the right direction. Just talking about it will will hopefully lead in a, in a direction of, of getting help. And as I say, you know, we we've we've come a long way with OCD and we do have ways and means of being able to deal with it. And um, there is hope. There is hope if you no matter how severe and uh, again, you know, with with my OCD, I felt it was really, really severe. But even from that, I was able to get it under control. So, you know, just speak to someone, uh, talk to a loved one, or call a helpline, or try and get yourself to to a professional. Um, and 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 if you do that, there is there is hope. Yeah, nice. Um, and you can pick up the phone and call the twenty year old shy. What do you tell him? <laughs> Uh, I guess maybe two things. I, I guess um, one, I would say to myself, "You are not your thoughts." I think that was a big one, a big one for me. You know, I uh, if I could tell myself that I often used to think that whatever thoughts I, I was having, I'm a bad person for having for having these thoughts. I would probably tell myself that I'm not my thoughts. Thoughts come and go, and just to let it be. You know, let it let it be. But I also I also feel, in a way, I might, <laughs> I, I might not give myself any advice. I'll tell you why, Stuart. In that, I tend to learn from experience, and I think if somebody tells me something, even if it's coming from myself in the future, uh, I almost d- don't listen until I actually experience something. And and and, yeah. I, and I guess I've had to go through this process of 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 ocd and having to think in certain ways and of, of the way i thought and the way my thoughts have progressed and how this process happened to get me to where i am now so if i had to give myself my advice i'd give myself that but also you know i'm okay with with, with not having had that advice and just getting to this point now through through learned experience you know what i mean yeah no it makes perfect sense uh and then lastly you've got a billboard uh in you're in johannesburg right yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so you got a, a billboard. Uh what do you want written on it? Hmm. Um it's a quite a quite a tough one. I know I've been listening to your podcast and now I <laughs> I, I knew this question was gonna come up, right? <laughs> um I think again, maybe a few things. I think one would be uh don't be afraid to speak up. Yeah. Um I would or I would have something like you know, let it be, or, or you are not your thoughts. Some somewhere around there, I would, I would, I would uh, put that on a on on a billboard. One of those, or all of those, you know. And um, I guess that would be my those would be my billboards. Yeah. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, is there anything you else you wish you could have said today? Um, no, I think 
I think I've covered it all, Stuart. Uh, I think I've, I've, yeah, there's not much else to say. Um, uh, yeah, I've covered it all. Nice. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on and uh, educating me on South Africa. And uh, <laughs> I've learned a lot. And I think many people will be able to relate for the, within their own countries um, and hopefully inspires us all to continue the work to kind of increase access to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. Thanks also to NoCD for sponsoring the show. For more information, please click the link in the episode description. A quick disclaimer, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.